Good morning, church. Let us pray. I would speak to you now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On 23rd September 2019, the then 16-year-old activist Greta Thunberg addressed the United Nations Climate Action Summit. When asked about the message she had for the world leaders gathered at that summit, this was her message in full, which I read to you now. My message is that we'll be watching you. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you, come, you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? For more than 30 years, the science has been crystal clear. How dare you continue to look away and come here saying that you're doing enough when the politics and solutions needed are still nowhere in sight? You say you hear us and you understand the urgency, but no matter how sad and angry I am, I do not want to believe that. Because if you really understood the situation and still kept on failing to act, then you would be evil, and that I refuse to believe. The popular idea of cutting our emissions in half in 10 years only gives us a 50% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees Celsius and the risk of setting off irreversible chain reactions beyond human control. But those numbers do not include tipping points, additional warming hidden by toxic air pollution, or aspects of equity and climate justice. They also rely on my generation sucking hundreds and billions of tons of your carbon dioxide out of the air with technologies that barely exist. How dare you pretend that this can be solved with business as usual and technical solutions? You are failing us, but the young people are starting to understand your betrayal. The eyes of all future generations are upon you, and if you choose to fail us, I say, we will never forgive you. We will not let you get away with this. Right here, right now is where we draw the line. The world is waking up and change is coming whether you like it or not. Thank you. Uh, end quote. That was not me, by the way. That was Greta Thunberg. <laughs> Greta Thunberg was 16 when she made that speech in 2019. Right? And let me put my cards on the table. I do not agree completely with either the substance or the tone or the way in which she made her point to the leaders gathered at the summit. Some of you who are of older generations may feel that you do not like being lectured to by 16-year-olds in this way. I gather that many of the world's leaders probably felt the same. I quote her speech in full to illustrate the kind of climate anxiety that we live in today. It is not just climate scientists and advocates who are concerned. According to a youth survey in 2022, conducted by Singapore's newspaper today, the top three feelings mentioned by young Singaporeans when thinking about climate change were negative. 45% of them were fearful, 31% were sad, and 29% said they were hopeless. A global survey in 2021 discovered that almost 40% of respondents from a diverse pool of places as far-flung as Australia is to the UK, Brazil, India, the Philippines, and the US, were hesitant to have children because of the climate crisis. Four in ten were hesitant to have children because of the climate crisis. In Singapore, that number was closer to 25%. Nearly 60% were very or extremely worried about climate change, and three quarters of them agreed that the future is frightening. 50% of them said climate anxiety was affecting their daily functioning. The climate crisis is not only worsening the planet's physical conditions, but it's such a huge hyper object that it is wearing down our cognitive and emotional ability to deal with this uh, situation. 
Research has shown a correlation, for example, between heat waves and a wide range of psychiatric conditions, such as depression and anxiety. According to Assistant Professor Cyrus Ho of the NUS Yong Yu Lin School of Medicine, suicides, particularly violent ones, have been observed to be more prevalent during periods of high temperature. This has become a matter of catastrophic concern. Ecological concerns have become a focal point of universal anxiety over the future because it threatens to diminish human flourishing in the short term, in the immediate term, and terminate our existence in the long term. The sense is that we are all doomed. So now you can understand why Greta Thunberg said, how dare you, you have stolen my dreams. That kind of threat makes the ecological movement unique in its claim on public imagination. Now, accompanied by this is a prof profound sense of grief that these environmental threats all have a human cause, that this isn't a crisis that's coming from outside, you know, like those movies about an asteroid hurtling towards Earth and ending life as we know it. This is a crisis that humans are bringing, in upon, bringing upon themselves. I came across a story of an activist who was estranged from the church. Her friend, who is an ordained minister in the Church of England, asked her, what is it that you so dislike about Christianity? She replied, the biggest thing is that the clergy, the pastors, are always talking about sin, and it all seems so negative and bitter, judgmental and life-destroying. But when her friend, the reverend, asked her, why are you so passionate about ecology? Without a second thought, she launched into a tirade about how people were damaging the air, the earth, the seas, and she wanted to spend her life changing their hearts and minds and reversing the damage they'd done. Her learned and astute friend, the reverend, finally said quietly to her, who's the one talking about sin now? You sound more evangelical about the environment than most pastors are about Jesus. Many environmentalists lament human participation in destroying habitats for other creatures and ourselves. And what's worse, many seem apathetic and indifferent to human causes of climate change. Now, in his sermon last week, Reverend Andy quoted a very influential essay by Lynn White Jr. that blames Christianity's misunderstanding of stewardship for Western society's role in damaging our environment. He also urged us to correct our misunderstanding by learning to own, love, and steward creation. For many environmentalists, what's at stake in the climate crisis is an economic, social, ideological, and a religious transformation. But perhaps most of all, climate anxiety is suffocating especially to the many who feel that the crisis is something that can be significantly addressed through public policy initiatives like legislative change, regulation, and prescription. In 1972, the first UN conference on the environment was held in Stockholm, Sweden, and the public forum on the fate of the planet was held in earnest. Henceforward, the great debate in environmental circles have between, has been between idealists who want to promote a different way of life that is not based on a predatory relationship with Earth, and the pragmatists who want to focus the movement on achievable legislative regulation. The Earth is like a ship, like the Titanic, propelling itself towards the iceberg, and the Earth's richest nations are like the Titanic's owners saying, faster, faster. Of course, the problem with the Titanic was not that it didn't have a rudder, but that the captain didn't use it. In just the same way, say activists, it's not too late for the earth to change course once people accept how catastrophic our present course of navigation is. The problem is, and once again to quote Greta Thunberg so forcefully, there doesn't seem to be the collective political will to make changes happen. You have stolen our dreams, is the rallying desperate cry of those who have placed their hope in politics or business leaders. I hope you've been to see that all of this is no solution. The hopelessness of climate anxiety and ecological crisis will not be solved by politics, human ingenuity or collective action, 
although all of these will be important for that. The world's despair cannot be solved by the better, angel, better angels of human nature, even if every leader in the world were Greta Thunberg. Romans makes clear that the universal problem of creation's decay requires a universal solution. Creation, says Paul, is languishing in groaning and subject to futility. The Old Testament image of mourning and groaning is a description of ecological death, such as severe drought, desertification, and species extinction. And I think it is that image that Paul is drawing on when he talks about creation's groaning. This is God's judgment on human sin, not just Adam's sin, but the curse that all human sin brings down on the earth over and over and over again. All of creation, ourselves included, has been groaning because of our bondage to decay, our bondage to sin. We should not be surprised to find that Paul believes that the natural order is connected to the moral order. How many of us really know what Paul means by the groaning of creation? Today we can speak of how small the world is, not how large it is. Mass communication and transportation have given the impression that we have mastered the world. We can almost hold it in our hands like a globe. We have lost most of the awe and wonder of earlier times when people reveled in how big the world was and how majestic God had made it. People used to watch the sky, not TV, to find out what the weather would do. They patterned their lives around the seasons. They respected the limitations placed upon them by nature. We aren't really aware of this in Singapore, but if you look at the liturgical tradition of the church, Lent and Advent and so on, you'll find that they come in periods where in, in the countries where the cycle naturally is leading from a time of bleakness, a time of uh, darkness, a time of emptiness, to a time of new life or new light. Right? For example, Advent to Christmas, where the darkness of the world is at its peak, right, is where Advent is. And just as we hit Christmas, the dark days are beginning to turn shorter and shorter and light comes through. That makes sense. We, we have lost that kind of sense of time moving around that way. So aware were past generations of the natural world that they would naturally think of creation's existence as primary to their own, for they depended on it and lived within it. Continuing human sin corrupts creation in various ways. We selfishly and mindlessly consume its resources, we pollute it with unsafe manufacturing processes. We accelerate potentially harmful changes by pouring greenhouse gases into the air and so on and so forth. By abusing our role as stewards of creation, we have contributed to the frustration of that creation, preventing it from achieving its ultimate end of glorifying God by being what God intended it to be. But Paul's message is not one of climate anxiety or frustration over cre creation's future. Paul's hope is in Jesus Christ, whose incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection are proof that there is nothing, he says, nothing, 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 no situation, no power, no force that can separate us from the love of God. Paul does not go into great detail about how all creation will be saved. And in the final analysis, Romans 8 is tantalizingly vague about just what the future of creation will look like. But Paul does make three vital points. First, he says, creation has a future. It is the creation that is in bondage to corruption, that groans and is subject to futility, that he says will one day experience the freedom that accompanies the glory of the children of God. Romans 8 makes clear that creation has a secure role in the continuing story of God's redemption. Paul's conviction that all creation shall be redeemed and not just humanity is not an original thought. The church believed this and Israel believed this long before Paul came onto the scene. We have forgotten maybe how much of the law of Moses 
is concerned with land. For example, allowing the full observance of the Sabbath and the Jubilee year to allow not only human work to stop, but for the land itself to rest. The Bible invokes nature, the seas, the mountains, the animal kingdom as God's agents for communicating with humanity. For example, in the prophet Joel, locusts are used to punish the disobedient. In Micah, the mountains are called upon to be a jury to decide God's case against Israel. The psalmists revel in the beauty of nature as mediators of the glory of God, not distractions from it. Jesus himself quotes Psalm 37, 11, suggesting that the grass, lilies and birds point beyond themselves to the Father's care. Ancient Christians said that nature is not just a resource or a garden entrusted to our care. Nature itself is a revelation of the ways and the will of God. As in the Old Testament, the New Testament reveals that God's plan for redemption and salvation encompasses all of reality, physical as well as spiritual. That means us, humans, but also nature and the spiritual realm, the universe itself. Nothing will be left out of God's salvation. As we contemplate the terrible strain that the world is under in our time, we badly need to recapture this grand vision of God's redemption and salvation for all creation and not just for individual persons. Second, Romans 8 also makes clear that it is God who will transform creation and that He will do it at the culmination of redemptions of human history. The one who both subjects creation to frustration and futility and also sets it free from that decay is God. Creation's waiting in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed implies that this is the moment when creation will be transformed, when the sons of God are revealed. In this context, the revealing of the sons of God must refer to that moment when believers are publicly disclosed as the people of God. This is an event we are told in Scripture that accompanies Christ's own final revelation. So creation's ultimate hope lies in something only God can do. Can the church finally bring Jesus back to earth? No. God, the Lord Himself, will reveal Him, Himself fully to the world when the time has come. Our role is not to, as it were, hasten His arrival, but to be faithful to Him when He does. And so, creation's hope lies in that, in that final revelation of Christ, something only God can do. On this one hand, on the one hand, this truth should encourage us. There is indeed hope for creation. And this hope, Paul says in Romans 5, will not put us to shame. We know the one who has promised. He will do it. And yet this truth also should remind us of our human limitations. There is no human effort, no human government program, and no Christian ministry that will finally transform creation. We must be sober-minded about it. As long as sinful humans live amongst creation, it has no hope for ultimate transformation apart from God. And so we must therefore resist a kind of green utopianism. The idea prevalent that our own programs, if fully instantiated, will usher in environmental nirvana. The story of creation in the Bible begins with an act of God and it completes with the act of God. However, on the other hand, our distinctive Christian ethos and hope does not mean that we should fall, fall sway to a pessimistic, what can we do anyway, passivity. Now, I understand that it might seem counter to contemporary reality to believe that the entire creation is waiting for the emergence of the sons of God who will be empowered and take responsibility for its restoration. To believe that the forces of exploitation and oppression will be finally tamed by the actions of the children of God in the sense that our altered lifestyle and ethics will begin to restore the ecological system 
seems to overestimate the impact that we can make in the light of contemporary experience, correct? I mean, you can see, you can go to your office and say, hey guys, let's stop using uh, reusables and all that, but the next day, your friends will tell you, hey, you know Singapore, NTUC, don't sell, don't, plastic bag cost five cents, go JB and buy, JB plastic bag free one, you know? So, there, there, this sense that how much impact can I make, right, feels very unrealistic. I want to share with you, my friends, that it is God who ultimately transforms His creation. And Romans 8 promises that He will do that. But that does not mean that you and I have no calling or role in working to bring creation closer to the goal that God has set for it. The revelation of God's purposes carries with it a, a calling to participate in those purposes. And while our role ultimately cannot be to transform creation, we do have a role in bringing it closer to that goal. We cannot create Eden on earth. Only God can, and He will, but God expects us and indeed commands us to anticipate to the best of our ability that final state of life. We demonstrate that we are God's children by exercising the kind of dominion that heals rather than destroys. And in this way, creation does await the revelation, the revealing of the sons of God. Because it is the sons of God who will give nature a brief foretaste of that permanent relief that is coming. In Romans 8, Paul says that creation, in fact, is like part of the church. It joins the ranks of Christians in groaning and waiting eagerly for redemption. And so I want to tell you that creation is the church's sibling. She is our sister, our brother. The final goal is not the destruction of creation, but the unification of heaven and earth, such that the renewed heavens and earth itself becomes God's dwelling place. We are not going to heaven. Heaven is coming here. This is the hope of creation that the long shadow of its plight has now begun to recede that the, now that the children of God have been revealed through Christ's resurrection. This freedom, this liberation from the destructive effects of sin awaits its completion at the end of history when we ourselves will attain our full salvation. And since creation's bondage is due to human sin, its freedom awaits the end of human sin as well. And so, my friends, if we accept the diagnosis that human wrongdoing is responsible for ecological degradation, it follows that those who are concerned about living according to God's will must be concerned about avoiding and repairing damage to God's creation as far as possible. We cannot ourselves achieve the final liberation of creation, but we can certainly anticipate it. This accords well with the way Paul portrays believers in Romans as already participating in that life to come. He says, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. And this is what makes their groaning, our groaning, not only an expression of suffering, but a groaning that expresses our yearning of hope of the life to come. To avert and to repair ecological destruction would be to practice the hope that believers share with the rest of creation. Hope does not exist in the abstract. It exists in the concrete. It is the lived practices of hope that will influence the way human societies function in relation to the rest of the natural world. You've already heard Reverend Andy's sermon last week about owning, loving, and stewarding creation. And before that, Reverend Lei Swan offered us practical suggestions on how to live responsibly. I think that hope that guides our ethics and our actions is something that you observe, for example, it's a truism that you observe when you see, for example, your children, when you tell them, on this date, we are going on a holiday. And how do they behave? They begin to maybe pack their bags very early. They, in my case, my son, my son very strangely, um, maybe has learnt it from adults, begins to Google places that he would like to go. And he plans for what day we will go there, right? And what we will do when we get there. 
In my time as a pastor here in Sengkang, I've gotten to know pastors who were on, about to go on sabbatical. And, I, and believe you me, they live in a different way. Maybe the only one who is more saintly, I notice, is uh, Reverend Andy. He was very, very uh, clear about what he was going to do right, uh, before and after sabbatical. But even then, there's a difference in him. Right? There was, there's a weight lifted off his shoulders as he approached the beginning of his sabbatical. This sense that the hope that exists in the future guides our actions now is a truism. It's not a profoundly new thought to us. But I want to suggest to you that is precisely the way we are to navigate the anxiety of the future in re with regard to the ecological crisis. Hope for the future, in this sense, takes human action into account. It remains hope, yes, hope deferred, hope in the future, but it is hope now in the power of God's grace, working through and not around, and, uh, not around or above human cooperation. We live as people who rejoice in having been adopted as God's children and eagerly anticipate our inclusion in God's family when our bodies are raised. And so we work in the sober realization that our best efforts will always fall short of the glorious outcome that God intends for us and the world. And yet we also work in confidence because God supplies His Spirit to guide and empower us. And most of all, we work in hope because we know that working in this way, we are aligned with the purposes of God for the universe. And in this way, we give others a chance to glimpse the hope that we profess. In closing, I want to say to you that these verses that we have meditated on today and over the last three weeks as we talked about creation care, do not dangle at the periphery of the gospel. They profess the fullness of Christian hope. It is this hope that is the true conquest of creation. We are more than conquerors because finally all creation will be conquered by the loving power of God. We shall finally overcome the despair, the groaning and the suffering that we endure. God is not a power-hungry status freak who has stolen our dreams. He has sent heaven's best, His Son, that He might establish in us the dream future that He has for creation. He has sent His Son so that this dream future might be established in us, with us, and through us. The universe is the theatre of God's glory. And so I want to tell you that for Christians, the ecological crisis might be a problem, but it is not a suffocating problem that should make us anxious all the time. We don't just care about creation because if not, we are doomed. Instead, what Christians do in the face of the ecological crisis is to turn our groans into singing, seeking to turn our lives and the world into a song of hope, not despair. We inspire others to sing with us and find in themselves a voice that they never knew they had. We sing this song of hope back to those who are in despair until they too learn to sing it with us. My friends, may all of us be so moved by love and gratitude to God and the hope that we bear witness to that our lives will, will proclaim the great good news of the gospel in creation. And in so doing with our lives, let us proclaim the hope that lies within the hope 